Okay, I'd like to now introduce our uh, next speaker, uh, Varun Agarwal. Uh, Varun uh, brings an interesting mix of experience. Uh, he did his uh, undergraduate from Delhi University and then went on to do a master's from uh, MIT in the US. Uh, Varun uh, uh, runs a startup called Aspiring Minds, which I think he started 10 years ago. Yeah, about 10 years ago. I think uh, they basically work in the area of employment uh, assessment and credentialing. And I think they're among the largest firms in the world doing that. And I think they aim to basically drive meritocracy in labor markets. So over to Varun without much ado. Thank you. That was a, I mean, a very interesting talk uh, with Sunita gave when she talked more about uh, theory. So I'll take uh, a lead from there and talk about application of machine learning and AI in the industry, which now I've been doing for the last uh, six to seven years uh, at Aspiring Minds. Uh, and what I'm going to do in this talk is show you some of the work where we are applying machine learning uh, in our context. And also from there, try to derive some tips on uh, how the industry problems look, what are the kind of challenges uh, which are out there uh, when you're solving problems in the real world, and what you may uh, do uh, or learn to handle some of these problems. So before uh, you know, I get into uh, the machine learning application which we're doing, what does this company do? Uh, so we started around in uh, 2008. And the, this was a problem which we were trying to solve, that there are all these people who are coming out of uh, education. Uh, and there are all these companies who are wanting to hire these people. Uh, but there's this information asymmetry which is out there, right? So people who are coming out of education don't really know what skills do they have and how do they benchmark to what the industry is looking for. So if I want to be a software engineer versus a product manager versus a salesperson, what are really the skills required? Do I benchmark to the skills which the industry uh, is looking for? And if not, what are the gaps and how I, I can improve on those gaps? Uh, and second, uh, how do I signal my employability, right? So if I do have the skills, let's say for being a software engineer, uh, how do I make a case to the companies that you should talk to me? I have those skills. You know, there are so many, I think there are like 50 lakh graduates which come out every year in India and the numbers are, you know, similar across the world. And companies have a very hard time finding who's employable or suitable for the job and uh, interviewing that person. So they would use other signals in the market like going to the top colleges or GPA and so on, uh, which disenfranchises a lot of people uh, who have the skills but do not, uh, do, are not able to signal that to companies and make a case for them to get uh, interviewed. And resumes also do not work very well at least at the entry level or zero to three uh, years. So this is, a, this is a global problem and it's a very interesting paradox which we have across the world where uh, students or people say there are not enough jobs, and companies say that there are not enough people, we are not able to fill our positions. Uh, so what we came up with was uh, saying that let's build a test, uh, which is a multidimensional test of various different skills, spanning anywhere from language to cognitive skills to behavior, personality, and variety of domain skills, anywhere from finance and accounting to programming and so on and use these assessments uh, as a way to give feedback to candidates on their skills, benchmark them using data as to uh, what kind of skills are required in the industry and feed that back to people and also create uh, these signals and credentials uh, uh, which are visible to the companies, which help them hire. So we've been doing now this uh, for 10 years. We've scaled to some 3 million assessments Annually, we work with 3,000 plus companies, 100 large companies. Started from India, but expanded to USA, China, Philippines, uh, and so on uh, over all these years. And uh, during this, a lot of emphasis has been on the product, the assessment product which sits uh, here in between. Uh, and basically, the, the, one of the primary machine learning or AI co uh, questions which we look at is that uh, when you go beyond multiple choice question-based tests, Right? So if you want to grade someone's English, you would rather want him to write a paragraph or an essay and then generate a grade on it rather than giving them multiple choice question-based tests. Or if you're doing spoken English, then pretty much MCQs get ruled out. So how do you really grade automatically on scale open responses? So a lot of our work over the last 10 years has been uh, in this area. Uh, uh, and let me start with one of the first uh, examples. So we've done a lot of work in grading programs uh, automatically. Uh, this, uh, you know, so we did our first, built our first system and did our first paper in 2014 at KDD and then there are 
two more and one is my colleague will be presenting at IAAI next week. Uh, so let me take you through some of this work uh, and what were some of the insights generated. So here was the problem statement in, uh, uh, in evaluating codes or programs. So of course, manual evaluation doesn't scale, it's not standardized, you're just talking how, you know, even in a class or a course when they're like, 500 students which are enrolled, it's very hard for the teaching assistants to go through all those programs, so which past test cases are good, but what about the rest, and how do you make sure that there's quality feedback or grades which are being generated for it? Uh, the test case-based evaluations uh, have a problem of both false negatives and false positives. Uh, there are a lot of codes which are, you know, nearly correct in logic or their algorithm, uh, but uh, because of an inadvertent error, would go a very, uh, get a very low test case score. In fact, uh, more recently what we have shown is that if you're doing a fixed time test, like a one hour test, 16% uh, of codes that don't even compile have nearly correct logic. So they should have got a grade of four out of five or three and a half out of five and they don't even compile. So, so that's, the, uh, that's the problem which we were trying to solve as to how do you give a good, uh, do good evaluation of codes, which is not just test case based, but on the algorithmic capability of the candidate, which the industry really cares for. Uh, so the first uh, you know, couple of tips which I like to say here is that the industry you know, where we spend a lot of our time is defining the product, right? So uh, a lot of times one of the, uh, and defining the product and then translating it to a scientific question, right? And by, by what I mean by translating it into a scientific question is something whose efficacy I could find out objectively whether it's working or not, right? And, uh, and a lot of times when we talk to students who are coming out of colleges or uh, other people from the academia, one of the challenges is that they're working on defined questions. So they've done a lot of work on if there's a defined question, how do you find the solution? But in the industry, when we are doing applied stuff, the methods become more commoditized. What you're spending more of your energy is that if there's an open real world problem, how do you define how you will solve it and translate it in a scientific, uh, scientific uh, question. So this is how we defined the tool which we were building, that this will be an automatic test of programming skill, where the person can write the code uh, in a compiler integrated environment within, a te uh, within the test, where they can write code, compile it, run it, run test cases, and so on. And what we would go out on evaluation is, one, a machine learning based score, which is on the programming ability or the algorithmic correctness of the solution, we'll talk a little more about that. A second score will be on the, uh, on programming best practices, right? So what really the industry cares for is that not only whether the code is functionally correct, but how are the programming practices, is it scalable, modular, if you give it to another coder, will he or she understand it or not? And the industry kind of spends, you know, huge amount of time just maintaining code, right? I think bad code is like, what get keeps the IT services industry keep going, uh, but they can become more efficient if the code is, code is good. And the third, the time complexity of the code is to, whether it's ON, ON square, ON log N, and uh, this was again done by a simple regression using simulating the time for different uh, sizes of test cases. So this is the kind of output, and this is the, like the definition of the product uh, which we did. And uh, the, I'm going to talk in more detail about the first one out here. So <clears throat> how did we again think about uh, grading a program? And we're saying, is the algorithm correct or not, or near correct or not, which is a real world question. So we said that, okay, what does the grader look for? So let's say we are talking about this program where you have to print a pattern of in uh, integers like this. This is a very typical implementation of that code. So this was what were some of our observations as to what graders look like. So the first thing they would look like is that are the basic keywords even out there, right? So here you need a loop, you need a print statement. If you don't see a loop and a print statement, you will pretty much say that, okay, this code doesn't work, right? So there's some basic keywords which you will look for. Till now, I'm just talking very simply, if you talk about NLP, I'm talking about bag of words, right? Certain words should be there. Uh, then I would go a little deeper and say, hey, this is a matrix, so there has to be a nested loop, right? A loop in a loop, rather than two loops one after the other. Uh, and I'll then go further and say that, you know, there are certain data dependencies which I am looking for, right? So I would say that, hey, because 
this is the diagonal, the conditional in the inner loop should depend on the outer loop's variable, the variable which you're incrementing in the outer loop because the number of elements is dependent on number of uh, lines, right? So if I'm a grader and I'm looking at a code at a top level, I'll probably start by saying whether the right keywords are there, then saying whether the right control structures are there, and then going into saying are there the right data dependencies. Now, using this intuition gave us a way to translate this into a, a research question. Uh, and this is the kind of rubric which we framed. It's a very simple problem independent rubric. where We said that we'll grade every code on these five levels. One is, of course, completely functionally correct. Level four is correct with inadvertent errors, uh, which are silly errors like an initialization error or one of those. And then, interestingly, you see that the third level from the intuition which I had from the previous example is that it has the right control structures, uh, but it has missing data dependencies. Right? So you have, let's say, a for in a for, a nested for loop, but your conditionals are not right. And, uh, and the level lower than that was just having the keywords and tokens present, and one is the code is unrelated to a given task. So this is an evaluation rubric which we use to frame the problem, uh, which work very well in our setting in the industry, right? So there can be many different ways of framing this problem. Uh, one could frame it as saying that we want to detect which algorithm the person has written and how close uh, the person's solution is to that algorithm, which would change from problem to problem. And I'll talk about some scalability issues with that. But this is how we defined it and worked quite well in our situation. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, the, and this is what, when I was saying that how do you take it from, the, from a product idea to a scientific question which works for you in, in your situation. Uh, <clears throat> so the major contribution in this work was designing the features. Uh, how do you really design the features? And uh, there's an interesting um, you know, uh, intuition about when you compare programs with natural language. What makes the problem harder and what makes the problem simpler? So of course, what you would say makes the problem simpler than natural language is that you have a strongly typed grammar, right? So you can understand their rules which programs follow and you can parse and you can create trees and you can create control flow structures and data dependencies which you cannot do very well with natural language. What makes the problem harder is that uh, in uh, natural language, uh, you can say, uh, if you have a word, even the bag of word approaches work very well because a word with some of its context around it gives you a very good idea of what the person might mean and might want to say. But when you look at programs, uh, it is really uh, where the context of whether a print statement is within a for loop or a for in a for loop is very important, right? Like in, uh, in its, uh, the, inter, uh, the interrelation between how these keywords have been placed is very, very important, and that's what we wanted to capture in the features. So of course, we had the traditional features of keywords and token counts, but then we said, can we, uh, can we have deeper features which, uh, 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 which uh, uh, capture some of the control flow structures, some of the data dependencies, and so on, which I discussed in the rubric, which I presented before. So what we do for a typical program is that we uh, generate the control flow graph, and then we have these counts, which is like of control-related keywords, which is the number of fors, the number of fors in fors, the number of whiles, and then uh, even the control context of other keywords in the program. So the feature is basically uh, keywords in their control context, and we count all these different features uh, in the program, which are basically both uh, not only the keyword, but the control context of the keyword. Now, just to make sure uh, you know, this is clear is there is not that we have a list of features. This is just counting all the keywords in their control context, right, and creating a vector of it. Uh, we went down deeper and said that, okay, let's draw the data dependency graph. And uh, you can see that on the, on the right uh, out here, where it says that, oh, a variable which was initialized zero was then incremented it was also compared with another variable. The variable which was compared with another variable, one of those variables was then incremented. So you have this whole data dependency graph of the program. And then you convert it into features. Uh, the first thing which you simply do is saying that uh, you capture, I'm sorry. <coughs> uh, you say that uh, uh, this I've already talked about. This is the control context of the data related features but then you also capture the counts of data dependencies. So you count, for example, there's a variable i related to a variable j, 
which was previously incremented. So we'll count all the instances of a variable which is related to another variable which was previously incremented. So the i's and the j's are abstracted as just variables, but you're just saying that what operations were being done with variables and what kind of data dependencies uh, were there. And then we even captured the control context, which is another feature where we say that, oh, a variable which was incremented in a loop in a loop was dependent on a variable which was in another loop. And if you go back to the intuition which I was uh, talking earlier about that matrix structure with the print statement, that is exactly the data dependency uh, which makes it work. That there's a, there's a variable in the conditional of a for and a for which depends on a variable which is uh, in, the, in the conditional of the outer for. So this was a whole feature grammar which we, uh, which we designed uh, for, for programs uh, and automatically getting all these features and then being able to do uh, supervised learning. So uh, simply stated, this was the result. So this benchmarked on five different uh, problems. On the right extreme here, you can see the test case. If you just use the test case, what kind of correlation do you get with human grades? So all these scores were uh, graded by humans. And then we saw that uh, what kind of correlation you're getting. This is the validation uh, correlation for the machine learning technique, where you see that all the validation correlations are more than 0.79. Uh, whereas if you look at test cases, it goes to 0.54 and 0.64. And it matches, uh, you know, if you get uh, multiple raters to rate these codes, uh, this correlation matches the inter-rater correlation. Of course, if you go in details in the paper, we also show that if you just use bag of words, it doesn't do as well. So the new features which we have really designed really add incremental value to solving the problem. So this is one of the first works which we did, and this tool is now used quite, um, quite a bit across the world. Amazon uses it in the US to hire software engineers, SD ones, SD two. It's used by Wipro, it's used by Deloitte, it's used by Morgan Stanley, and so on. It's become uh, very, very popular. Uh, <clears throat> so what was some, is, I'm sorry, yeah. What is the nature of the problem that sure. kind of gave it a low, I mean, where do you fail, where do you succeed? Right, so, uh, you know, uh, the kind of problems which we work with, uh, programming 101 kind of problems, like print patterns and so on, going to sorting, searching, um, those kinds of, some uh, questions which are introduced in our data structure courses and so on. Um, honestly, we have not done very deep analysis of when it fails and when it succeeds, because mostly it was coming in the range which we want. We have seen that sometimes when they're complex data structures, it's not able to work very, very well. So that's one observation we did have in the solution. Yeah. So uh, some tips uh, here, again, from the industry point of view is that industry problems are generally multidisciplinary in nature. So the person who worked on it, he's now a graduate student at MIT. He uh, had to understand compilers. He had to understand uh, program analysis, data dependency graphs, control flow graphs, and fuse it uh, with understanding of machine learning and supervised uh, learning. Uh, so that's how uh, problems are. Mostly it's expensive and time consuming to get good labels. So for 90% problems in the industry, data sets are small if you want good labels with it. Only either problems which a lot of people are interested in, like speech recognition or translation, do you have large uh, data sets or where labels get collected naturally. And even when labels get collected naturally, when you really sit down to clean them and work it out, you find that there's almost like, generally I have seen that a project like this takes us 18 months, and out of that, nine to 10 months are just getting the data in the right shape and form. So uh, a lot of work which we do, the data sets are small, and you have to use techniques which can work on small data sets. Uh, it's always useful to have theoretically plausible features like we have here, which goes on um, to uh, being a function of data sets being small and you wanting not to have very brittle models like uh, Sunika was talking about. I'll talk a little more about this in the forthcoming uh, slides on some of the observations uh, from our work. Uh, so, uh, oh, it's not there. So typically for a program, one programming, and I'll get into it where more in more details further, but for one programming problem, because these are problem dependent models. So for every programming task, you have to build a model, right? So typically for one programming problem, we have seen that you can get good accuracy if you have 
around uh, 300 to 400 points. And how many programs do you That's the number of programs, 300 to 400 programs per programming task. Yeah. So uh, this is what I was just coming to, that the uh, machine learning models are question specific or task specific, right? So if you're doing binary search, you'll be looking for an if in a for. I mean, machine learning will automatically learn that the, you need an if in a for. If you're doing a bubble sort, it will look for a for in a for. There's a very simple example. Now, uh, the problem is this solution doesn't scale. So if you talk about aspiring minds, we have 500 plus questions in our database. Uh, we support 35 plus programming languages, right? So how do you get machine learning to scale across uh, all these different problems? That means you need 500 into 35 different models and 500 into 35 into 400 data points to get all these models. Uh, so generally solving for the industry needs scale and you have to think when you're thinking about these solutions that they have to scale to multiple, how in the real world the problem will really uh, get solved and how do you uh, worry about that? So this was the second uh, set of work which we did, uh, which we published in 2016, where we said that, can we have a question independent model? So rather than having a model for each question, we have one model uh, which works for all questions, right? And is able to generate a grade. Uh, <clears throat> so there were two main ideas out here. Uh, you convert, can you convert the original features into what we call as structurally invariant features, right? So features which would retain their messaging across problems, right? So if uh, s simply stated in, uh, if you're looking at very linear features and monotonic features, you say that if the value of this feature was high, it means it's a good solution. If the value of this feature is low, it means it's a bad solution. And the same feature works across different problems, right? Uh, so what we really exploited here was that uh, test cases can at least tell us what are good solutions. They may not be able, to, a subset of good solutions, they may not be able to find all the good solutions, but to, uh, programs which pass all the test cases and with certain other <coughs> tests, we can say, automatically say these are good programs for this problem. There's something which you cannot do in natural language, right? You cannot say for an essay automatically that these bunch of essays are good, but for programs you can say that, yeah. So template solutions generally do not work because uh, what we find is that even for a short problem, the amount of variability, I mean, it's astounding how many different ways people can write solutions. And even if it's conceptually, uh, you know, the same idea, it can be written in so many different ways that template solutions do not work at all in, in our experience. So yeah. that what is the generalizability? Uh, generalizability in the sense? What you're saying, suppose I have templates. Yeah. Sure, so what we have seen is that there is generalizability when we see it, when we test it on unseen test, uh, unseen uh, data. Our own intuition is that because features, the way the features are desi designed, it can extrapolate and interpolate between the good programs which are out there, because the features. For example, on what kind of? Uh... No, for, so for example, uh, if you can uh, break down a program into saying that there are certain kinds of logical constructs where you will, uh, you can combine a loop in a loop uh, with an increment, and in another program you can combine uh, a loop in a, you can do it. Uh, so what I'm saying is that let's say if we say that programs can be broken down into chunks of things which you have to do to get to the right solution, which could have certain control structures, certain data operations, and so on. The question we are trying to ask is that if you combine, if you find some in one program and you find some in another program, if you pick some from one program and some from other program, will it still work, right? And I think it does work that way. You know, so because the features are designed in that way, if I was doing back of words, it would not work. So there is, you can interpolate between that space. And another observation, interestingly here, was that linear models worked very well. So there was very little incremental value of doing nonlinear models, which again showed that there was some interoperability and generalizability in the feature space. Yeah, yeah. But that should come from, I mean, Machinik's book talks about compiler techniques, so you do data flow analysis and control flow analysis. Yeah. You can do network removal, you can do 
right so we didn't have machine learning then right so why do you need machine learning here no so uh, with so we use all those techniques to come to our features but the question is that using all those techniques if the program doesn't pass test cases how will you grade it how will you still give a partial grade to saying that how correct the solution is so we're using all those techniques to generate features and then those features to link to a partial grade to the program to give a quality score which is based on the semantics of the program so it's interesting conversation by the way because program analysis folks live in their own world machine learning folks live in their old world and uh, but i can assure you that within programming languages is not a solved uh, problem in their domain so it's interesting that there's been some talks but it is not that they talk a lot uh, all the time i have one question here yeah uh, okay. so you said that uh, like uh, there are different ways of writing the same program right yeah yeah so you have a for loop i can just use loop unrolling technique and then i right. can use some cache locality but there are like n number of ways to write one particular program so your training data should take care of all these possible cases right so that's what the other question was that it could take a sample of the cases if the features allow you to generalize and interpolate between two good programs and create third intermediary programs but if the ingredients in the terms of features are not present in the sample then you would not be able to grade that program right so from a machine learning or statistics perspective you would see whether that works or not from a statistical perspective of seeing how it generalizes on unseen codes which you have not used in the training sample so all the results i am showing you are for unseen codes which is for validation data right so what you are saying is that uh, so let me talk a little more about it so if i was creating a data set for this and it will become a little more clear when we talk about this work out here but if i was clear, uh, creating a data set uh, for this i would want to say that it is diverse enough to capture the variety of ways a person is writing the program and my sample sizes will depend on that so probably i could show you a graph where as the sample sizes increase the accuracy increases and saturates uh, at some point of time but also i can cluster on in an unsupervised way without within that data set to see that how many different uh, you know uh, method, methods of solving the problem are there and have benchmarks around that so that is all theoretically all those things you can do so yeah. uh, there are websites such as lead code etc have you used some of the programs from there as well because many students use them and uh, another related question is uh, there are also many programmers who go to lead code and write their own code and you can actually test their output they they can do some output analysis like whatever yeah, test yeah. case you have yeah. so people themselves can generate lot of correct programs correct yeah so people can so yeah first we do use these data sets we create a lot of data our own as well so you know we probably create a million data points every year on programs uh, so it's easy to get the correct but this is a supervised machine learning technique which has a whole rubric right so you need labels on all levels of the rubric which now i'm you know so this is a segue to but i'm happy to take more questions this is evoked lot of interest due to disbelief or otherwise uh, i mean but i'm happy to take more questions okay good so yeah so the uh, the the <clears throat> Uh, so what i was talking about that how do you create these um, problem or task independent models uh, and uh, 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 and as what i was saying was that one of the things you can exploit in programs which you don't get in essays or other natural languages is that you can automatically say what are good programs or what are set of good programs by running test cases and some other tests and the simple idea was that if you can create a distance metric for a program from the set of good programs in the feature space that can be a feature which is generalizable across problems right so convert the feature into a distance feature in the feature space now the problem is that if you convert it into a single distance feature then you you lose all the flexibility which machine learning gives you of having multiple features and so on so how do you trade that off uh, so this was the idea which i was just talking about that um, so these are like your the blue dots here are correct codes uh, uh, correct codes automatically identified and then you have these two other dots which are uh, codes which are incorrect but can be at different levels of the rubric 
and you're looking at the distance in the feature space and then hoping that that distance in the feature space correlates to the grade of the program. Uh, uh, so one idea was that you create multiple distances then a single distance so that you can still use uh, the power of the machine learning and regression uh, techniques. Uh, uh, so the simple idea was that different feature categories are linked to different parts of the rubric. So I showed you different feature categories. So you create distances in each of those uh, feature categories. So say in the keyword, uh, uh, in the keyword space, what is the distance? In the data dependency space, what is the distance? In the control structure space, what is the uh, distance? And you create these various distances and, uh, and then do machine learning on top of it, which is independent to any particular programming task, but it is across different programming tasks. And then you have to do variety of normalizations because the distance for one programming task may mean something else. As in the distance in the feature space for one programming task may mean different than others in, 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 in terms of scaling. Uh, so you do normalizations to handle some of those things. Uh, so this is how the system uh, worked that uh, you use the test cases results to automatically find a good set and then you do distance calculation of in the feature space for a new code which comes in, uh, find, develop your question independent features, uh, and then grade it, right? So remember here that it is for a new programming task, we still need a sample of good programs for it, which we automatically identify. So we get, when thousands of people take the question, we get a set of 300 to 400 good codes automatically, and then we use it to grade it. So for a new program, no more do we need new programming tasks, we no more need labels. We just need a sample of people to take it, and when we have a sample of people who have taken it, we automatically identify good codes and then create these distance measures, which is features, and then grade it uh, using it. So here are the results. So there was, we benchmarked this on to, uh, 20 questions in three programming languages, around 3,000 total codes. We trained it on eight questions uh, uh, which were seen, and then we tested them on a part sample of these eight questions, but 12 questions which were completely unseen, which we had not seen uh, there. So we built a supervised, this is again a supervised model where all these codes are graded, but we are building one model across programming tasks uh, out here. Uh, so these are some of the results, uh, you know, so on the left you have, um, uh, you have the question specific models, which is kind of the upper bound which you have on the right, you have the uh, baseline, what the test cases can do. Uh, and you can see what with different normalizations the question independent model can do. So it doesn't do as well as the question specific model. If you see uh, it's 0.84 versus 0.8 bias and MAE is 0 0.14, 0 0.24, but it gets close to it and pretty much for our purpose works uh, uh, well enough uh, for us. And again, one of the things and observations in this work is that a lot of times people just would report correlation and get done with it. In a lot of our work, you have to look at other measures other than correlations. And in fact, you should look at distributions rather than, uh, uh, rather than just looking at an MAE and an MSE or a Kappa and so on. Um, uh, so this, now the tool pretty much works on this technique, so we don't have the, the tool which is implemented in the real world has just one model. And there's an automated system when enough responses are collected for a new programming task and there are enough correct solutions that would start uh, giving a machine learning based score uh, for those programming tasks. Candidate is answering. He may answer in a in any given test. Likely, he will do at least four or five problems. It's not that he'll do one single problem. Yeah. Uh, your, uh, so when you when you're making it question independent, is it that I, I don't I think you're still dealing with only one question at a time. We are still dealing with a one question at a time. So if he does four or five questions, we will grade each one of them and then sum it. So that joining and to see the structure of because it's kind of question independent whether he is uh, following some proper practice. As in the law, of course, the logic will be different, but yeah. other aspects. So other aspects are anyway problem independent, right. question independent. So the, I showed you three things. The only the first one was problem dependent. We made it problem independent. The programming practices and the complexity piece was anyway right. question independent. Yeah. Um, um, 
So yeah, so some of the observation and tips, and these are a lot of them, I thought there'll be more student audience, so I've <laughs> put some tips there more thinking that there'll be more students. But you know, we generally go beyond traditional classification and regression when we are in the real world. Uh, and some of these tips are from the piece when students come in, they would say, oh, we just picked up a data set from the net, we ran a neural network, this is the result, right? And they would not understand how, I think a lot of effort for us goes in understanding the problem and then getting our methods to suit the problem which is out there and being able, trained to think about real world problems and translating them uh, into the methods which you have. Uh, as I already said, a single error metric is not enough. You need to see bias, you need to see distributions, uh, and so on. Um, and it's good to learn design of experiments. So a lot of these things just focusing on how you will create the training set, the test set, so that it is all validated. And you know, work which I'll not talk too much about here today is, uh, which the, test, the sets even get more complicated is when we were trying to do uh, how to grade non-compilable codes. So that's the third work in the series uh, of this. But these are some of the things which when I talk to my team come up uh, usually. So yeah, so this was the work which we've uh, recently done uh, where uh, programs have syntax errors, so they don't compile and we are not able to generate the control flow graphs and the data dependency graphs and so on. So how do you tackle them then? We find that 16% of candidates uh, who have uncompilable code uh, have nearly correct logic, right? So this is statistics from one of uh, the companies in India which uses uh, this tool. Uh, so we've recently now also able to handle codes that don't compile. The, uh, the naive idea is that if they don't compile, try to make them compilable, right? I mean, so when we do things like that with state-of-art techniques, we get around 54% codes get translated into compilable. That still lead, leaves 46% of codes which are not uh, compilable. And the way we are handling uh, them is that we are tweaking the parser and saying that can we, so we call it the rule relaxation method and say that can we, uh, can we relax the rules of the parser when it's creating symbol tables, when it is parsing statements and trying to uh, create ASTs uh, to also accept things which it would not in the general course of things. If anyone's interested, I'm happy to share uh, this paper. And interestingly, again, in the same paper, because we always have these scalability issues, right? So what we have shown is that uh, you can use reuse the same models which you have for uh, which you have developed for compilable programs and do some little bit of transfer learning on them and be able to make them work for non-compilable programs. Uh, so this is uh, another piece I'd like to uh, talk about is that what we see in our work again is that uh, there's a lot of interplay between AI machine learning and HCI uh, in creating very good products. So AI can give you a variety of, uh, uh, you know, um, insights in your data, in your programs, and so on. More and more, where the industry is going on is that machines can't do it whole, humans can't do it whole. There's some things which machines do well, there's some things which humans do well. How do you combine the efforts of both? So there the question of HCI comes is that if you have all these different uh, AI-based uh, outputs which you can give, how do you show them to uh, the human to get maximum value and make the right decisions uh, based on them? You know, so. Uh, just in our scenario, this is how it used to traditionally happen. A candidate takes a test. Uh, the test gives a report. That report goes to the assessor. The assessor then interviews the candidate. So this is the static uh, way how things used to happen conventionally. This is more and more changing into this kind of a diagram where the assessor has some kind of an interface with him or her. And the user is, uh, uh, is doing some things on that interface and you're generating online feedback for the assessor, not only based on what the candidate's doing, but by doing, um, getting data insights uh, into it. But how do, you, how do you show these data insights uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the candidate is where the HCI, the role of HCI comes. I'll just quickly show you two examples to motivate this. So for example, now we have a tool where we do automatic grading of video interviews. So a person takes a video, uh, takes in, uh, uh, the computer is asking him questions, he's answering with his or her webcam on. We get all these videos and then we automatically detect facial expressions, emotions, uh, voice emotions. We transcribe what the person has said and then use NLP methods to talk about content relevance and content correctness. In most of these cases, though you get all this input from machine learning, 
you use it to eliminate, let's say, the bottom 30%, but then the person wants to actually see the videos of the rest of the 70% people to make decisions. Right? So it's kind of this mixed approach where machine is eliminating some, but the other is the person would like to see. But when he's now seeing these videos, you can show him or her analytics on it. Right? So for example, this is a very simple um, toy example uh, of video analytics where we can show him when the person was smiling, when he was being expressive, what kind of posture he had, and be able to go, uh, you know, navigate to the video on these different points, right? So this is a question of HCI, that how do you show these inputs to this person so that he or she is able to use the system well, but also make the best uh, decisions, right? So this is how the interface looks for grading, where you, the person can see the video, he or she can already see the machine learning base code, see certain video analytics, uh, and then make decisions on it. So more and more in our work, we think that we are seeing that this being able to present, how do you present the input is becoming more and more important. Um, so whereas, and in fact, it's interesting that sometimes more than 50% of the impact is not created by the AI algorithm being there, but how you are presenting the input to the interviewer and how the system is used uh, to make decisions. Um, so very quickly, um, uh, uh, we have now used this kind of technology for doing uh, various different things, grading of essays, grading of emails. We have a tab-based test for grading motor skills, where based on what the person is doing with their hands on the tab, uh, we can grade on finger dexterity and so on. And most recently, we are creating, uh, so we want to test call center agents. So what we are simulating now is customers. So there's this test in which there's a chat and there's a customer which is simulated uh, who has, say, lost his or her credit card. And you're talking in natural language, and you're seeing whether the call center agent can respond right according to the SOP in the correct grammar without frustrating the customer, and so on. So it's going beyond grading to even simulating the environment which the candidate is in. Uh, uh, as I said, and then coming back to the idea of why you would want interpretable features and theoretically plausible features is that pretty much all AI is based on correlation and not causality. So when we do our essay grading work, uh, one interesting observation I have is that if you're trying to predict the grammar score and you use the content features, it gives a higher correlation in predicting the grammar scores using the content features than if you use features which you have for grammar. Right? So if you're only looking at, and why this happens is because you cannot create very good grammar features. So the grammar features don't give a very good prediction of grammar, but content and grammar are highly correlated. So the content features give a good prediction uh, of grammar, right? And some of these things break as you have larger data sets and so on. Uh, so it's good to have theoretically plausible things, and especially when you're making decisions on humans, where we, which we are in this case. If you're predicting a stock, maybe it's fine if you don't uh, have a theoretically plausible thing, but when you're making decisions on humans, uh, you think, and I think, uh, again, it's interesting to think, uh, uh, I think we have not, and I might be uh, not well educated about it, but we need to think a lot about our data sets and how these data sets are created and do they have the right properties of being able to even benchmark uh, things, right? So there's so much going within the data set and that's pretty much today the holy grail of saying whether the algorithm is correct or not, uh, right? For example, uh, if you look at essay grading, uh, you can create a content model which works very well on the data set of uh, responses for that essay. But if you put the same model on responses of uh, another topic, what you'll be surprised to see is that it gives a high grade on the content of essays written for a different prompt, right? And how we handle this is creating this artificial data where we use uh, data from other uh, prompts and put it as uh, zero graded data in our data sets. But I think a lot more needs to be thought about uh, in the various in, uh, you know, scenarios in the world of faking, uh, cheating, if, at least in our area, how do you create these data sets which are robust in testing uh, our algorithms? Okay, so uh, all this work in the last eight years, I mean a snapshot of uh, what we've been doing and thinking about, but this has also made us interested in generally in machine learning and doing some outreach in machine learning. So this was uh, one of the things we did three, four years back. We said that, can you teach data science to kids? You know, and really fifth to eighth class kids. And we did a few workshops and camps, and in fact, wrote a six ESC paper on it. And we were saying that if you're doing an applied, if you're teaching supervised learning to kids, can you do it in a hands-on way? 
uh, rather than making them run a program. Uh, uh, and go th take them through all the steps of supervised learning, starting with data, data cleaning, and building the model. Uh, and this is what we made them do. We made them make a friend predictor. So we gave them flashcards where there was a photo, a name, and a hobby. And we first got them to rate it on a scale of one to five, whether you'll make this person a friend or not. Uh, and there were like 48 balance set uh, of uh, photos. Then we used 32, 16 went out as a test set. And um, um, they built, you know, it was very intuitive. We said, okay, now tell us, uh, key all of this in an Excel, which is the hobby, the name, et cetera. And then now tell us what might decide you to make someone a friend or not. And they said, oh, it could be the gender, it could be whether the hobby is outdoor or indoor, so on and so forth. So they created the features themselves. They keyed in the features. They did a very simple thing of seeing which features are overrepresented in a class versus not, and then build these simple decision tree models. Right? So it was interesting that in these five hours, we were able to uh, get them from understanding data, features, and building a simple model themselves of a, of a decision tree. This, all this work is there on datasciencekids.org uh, uh, if anyone is interested in the general outreach uh, activity. Uh, we also started this website, which is called mlindia.org, which is, again, uh, which documents what are the research groups in India which are working in machine learning, what faculty are working in machine learning, uh, what kind of output India is creating, uh, research output India is creating in machine learning, what are the companies uh, which are out there in uh, machine learning, and so on, which is, again, uh, available for everyone. Uh, this is like based on Scopus data comparison of publications and so on, and there are a lot of them right now. Um, uh, what all of this analysis got me interested three years to four years back is on the research ecosystem in India, uh, saying that, uh, so one statistics which I generally have been quoting and I, ho I think it still holds is that if you look at the total research output of Indian machine learning in top conferences, Shingwa University alone does more than all of India. Right? So that's the kind of scale difference we have from uh, some of the countries. Even though Indians have done very, very well across the world in research, the Indian ecosystem itself doesn't produce uh, the kind of output uh, as uh, commensurate to its potential. So I've been thinking a lot about the research ecosystem in India, uh, which uh, led me to write a book which came last year. Uh, and uh, I think there's a lot of discussion today on AI and how machine learning uh, is doing and whether India, how India will compete with the rest of the world or the industry, uh, uh, be able to take uh, the advantage of the sudden disruption in machine learning. And I think the, I mean, my own view is that we are still very away and I think it, uh, the problem is that we still have very few experts in Indian machine learning. I think there are very few people like Sunita who can provide, produce a work of this caliber uh, in, this, uh, in this country, and we need a lot more. But, and the idea is that I think the problem is that machine learning is just instantiation. The general problem is of the research ecosystem uh, uh, in India, which doesn't work very, very well. Uh, uh, I'll just take you through a little few findings of the book, of course, uh, uh, taking, making sure that we are in the time. Uh, we don't have a critical mass of high quality researchers in this country. Uh, this is some of the data which I had culled out. So there's, this is very, some very interesting data which shows that the, so researchers in every country are in two places. They're either in government labs or they're in academic institutions. Now they're also in companies. One thing which happened uh, across the world was, so here you can see the ratio of people, researchers in universities versus in government labs. Right? So if you see the 1980s to the 1990s, you'll see that uh, uh, there's a skew towards more people being in government labs than in universities. Whereas if you see the post-2000s, and if you see most of the countries, uh, of course China also improved it, the ratio of uh, researchers in universities became much higher than the ratio of, uh, than the, uh, the number of researchers in universities became much higher than the number of researchers in government research labs because People understood that uh, the university system has been more productive in doing world-class research with the whole idea of new PhDs coming in and PhD trainings and so on. But India didn't change. So India is still 0.25. So that means that the most of the money which is spent on research in this country is for researchers who are in government labs. 
than in university. So there's a lot of discussion on the amount of money we spent on research, but the question is where are we spending that money and is that money being spent productively? And I'm not saying that uh, government research labs, all people who are at government research labs are not good or anything or of that sort, but across the world, there's been a movement towards funding research in universities, which India has not uh, uh, really taken up. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I have shown it to some people in Niti Aayog and in the government and so on, but as I'll talk more about it in a few minutes, I think you need more, um, you need policy and advocacy bodies around it. So you show it once to the government, they see it, they forget it. There has to be someone, it has to be an institutional effort towards saying that we need to change change things. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Right. 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 No, which I agree to. And uh, my point is that it always comes to the point which you are making. But we should even see that the money which we are spending, are we spending it on excellence? And I think if we start spending on excellence, even without improving the ratio, we can see a lot of change. At least that's what my view uh, view is. So this is again the number of uh, high performing researchers if you compare it. Uh, this is the data by the way from Microsoft Academic Research, the portal which you guys have. Uh, so China is seven times, US is 17 times. If you see the scale of our universities and the number of faculty members, it's much smaller than the scale of universities uh, in US and China. So we, don't even, we have a few centers of excellence but they also don't have the scale and the critical mass uh, of uh, people. For example, in IIT Delhi, which is now an institute of eminence, there are two people in machine learning and they're also not pure machine learning, right? So we just don't have the scale of, of people uh, in the country. Uh, this is an interesting graph, uh, but I'll quickly go through it. It just shows that number of researchers uh, with more than one citation, more than two citations, more than four citations. The only thing which I want to show here is that uh, this is the India line but it has the most sharp decay, right? So in no country can all researchers be highly productive, but in India, the quality, if you look at the quality of researchers, it's very skewed towards the lower end, uh, which this graph is showing. So number of researchers who do less than, papers with less than one, total number of citations less than one in a year is 55% uh, in India. Uh, whereas even in China, which many thought that do low quality papers, it's like 45%. And US and UK is on some, it seems, equilibrium because the lines converge, which is uh, where it is 35%. So there's a quality issue. Uh, I uh, say that a lot of times, I say that research is a lackluster career in India. So if someone uh, you know, does well at JE or in IES or in CAT, you can see it in the first pages of newspapers. I think no one cares if you top gate, for example, or net, right? So it's not a career which is very, very uh, popular, uh, and that's why it doesn't attract the best of people. There are very few people who get attracted, and the book talks about variety of um, uh, reasons for it based on different data. Uh, I think you need all of these three things to make it uh, interesting, which is awareness and selling. Uh, I'll just give you one example. Like, um, only 5% undergrads say that anyone came and pitched the MS or PhD program to them in their university, whereas all the companies will go and pitch to them that come join us, right? So there's very little push towards the research career uh, in any of the institutions uh, out there. And similarly, you know, and there's low stipend, there's the new PMRF which has come up, which is, according to me, again, a bad draft. I couldn't have got PMRF because I went to NSIT and the colleges which you have to be to get PMRF is a list which is, uh, uh, which is, so I think it's good intent but bad, bad drafting. So some of these issues have to be uh, taken care of. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'll just go quickly through this so that there's, yeah, yeah, because uh, I would want you to have questions. But I think in one line, what I think is that uh, pre-90s, um, the science ecosystem of India looks like the business ecosystem of India pre-90s. Nothing is regular, uh, everything is regulated, everything is tightly controlled. Uh, uh, and everything, and even when we start giving autonomy to institutions, when you read the draft, they're giving, there's lack of autonomy on number of things. So you need both autonomy and you need incentives and disincentives. Um, <laughs> lack of collaboration, both inside the country and globally. Um, travel money is hard to get in India, which is very surprising when you say 
It's one of the number one problems of researchers when you talk to them. And there's again a lot of data in the book. Uh, industry collaboration is less, and we talk about variety of things, but there are very few institutional efforts to get industry collaboration. So MIT, for example, runs a 50 people office just to do industry collaborations. In India, most universities don't run an office which is just working on industry collaborations. They run an office for placements, but they don't run an office for industry collaboration for uh, researchers. Uh, uh, this is the last point I wanted to make, and I'll just uh, wrap it up here and leave you on a slide. But I think we need to, uh, a lot of Indian research is derivative. So, and this is part of what I have been talking about in my presentation. We need to ask broad, bold, original questions. Uh, then doing research which is derivative, have more problem proximity. And the, the idea of doing a PhD, a good PhD shouldn't be three international papers. It should be, that's like the base benchmark. It should be that you're solving a problem that you are motivated about and solving it in a new way. Right? So that is one thing uh, which I think um, should, should change. And in interest of time, I'll just leave it here for you guys and invite questions. These are just some quick ideas. Of course, the, you need to do a lot more on policy and advocacy, but on things which can be done on ecosystem building and so on. And this is more, again, student focused than faculty. So with that, I'll end. Thank you. There are many people from ACM. I thought a lot of interesting points that might uh, spark discussion. But yeah, any questions for Varun? Um, there were a lot of questions during his talk, especially on the second half of the presentation. Yes. Yeah. What about industries involved in this? In India, for example, I think it's also a problem that the industry does not invest too much in academics. I absolutely, I absolutely agree. I think, uh, uh, and I think industry. I think you'll see that changing in the next five years because. Uh, the whole world, India has survived on the services economy for the last 20 years. That is rapidly changing with, uh, with machine learning, AI, and, uh, uh, and products being created. So the industry uh, is also starting to understand it. I think equal effort has to be made by the industry in, uh, towards uh, fostering research both inside and with academic institutions. First thing they should start, you know. So uh, an interesting thing is, in the last two, uh, two decades, industry has done a lot of work in upgrading undergrad education in India. And you know, so all these IT services companies have had programs uh, with institutions saying, how do you get better software engineers, right? I think the next decade, they should be working with PhDs and you see a lot of that happening. So I think there's a very good opportunity of that collaboration now happening because the industry is realizing the need of innovation and research because to survive in the global market, the services model is now going away. So they have to up their game and invest in innovation. So they have to, I completely agree, they have to make so equal effort. Global market, we have one billion population. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, 1,600 languages. Yeah. And in this, you're looking at translations across languages, Absolutely. or whatever it may be. Creating the databases. Yeah. I mean, it's up to us academics to create the databases in Indian uh, languages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't get PhD students to. No, and I. You know, this is. Why is it that the industry is not coming in to do something like this? See, an industry does some of the stuff, but it, there's no collaboration. The industry is finally looking at economic value. But I think what more and more the Indian industry has to see is that not only see at economic value in the short term, but in the long term. If they start looking at economic value in the long term. So finally, you have to tell the industry. I think one problem which comes when academics talk to industries that they say, you should be doing this for the good of academia, good of the nation. I think what they need to be told is that you need to be doing this for your own good. If you want to survive after 10, 20 years in this country, you should be doing this. And if they start thinking long term, they'll start making all these uh, investments. Yeah. So having been in IIT for many years, so one big problem which is not mentioned hmm. in your slide is the poor quality of support structure, yeah. right? I yeah. mean, just having accountable, and particularly if you're living in this semi-government kind of organizations where people have permanent jobs, you know, the support staff, I mean, I mean, we have excellent support staff in our department, but in general, you know, so for that, you need, in the, you know, this liberalization you're talking yeah. about, like you, you private universities, who will bring the Indian industry kind of efficiency right. in the academic sector is right. like sorely needed. Yeah. No, I completely agree. I couldn't show that slide. I think that is one of the top three reasons which faculty cite as a problem of not having enough and good 
support staff. So they're spending a lot of their energy in just managing day-to-day -day affairs and bureaucracy uh, than doing their research. And I think uh, that definitely needs to change. I can give you a very simple example. So if you now go to Ames, and I was, because of my father's health, I was going there a lot. So if you went there three years back, uh, though it has great doctors, the staff is so pathetic that you don't even know where to go to get something done. Now what they have interestingly done is that they now have a private company which is providing all the security staff, which has been given the responsibility of guiding people, managing crowds, and so on. And it's become like 100 times better. So there could be some of these solutions which could work in academic institutions as well that you know you outsource it to a vendor rather than having people on uh, government uh, you know government jobs which kind of takes away all the incentives and disincentives so there can be all these creative mechanisms which can be there i see very little political will actually to and taking that voice upwards uh, to the government to make those changes hi uh <clears throat> Uh, given the recent researchers on, you must be aware of that, given Sorry? the recent researchers on making the black box machine learning models more interpretable, mm. <clears throat> may I know your take on that? Do you find there's a trade-off uh, between making the information about the black box available versus preserving the trade secrets of your algorithm that you developed? Like, what do your take on that? See, I think, uh, and I might be wrong, I think they're not too many trade secrets after deep learning has come, everything has become so commoditized and in the open source community. I think the larger problem is that when you talk to people, they think that Google invented deep learning, which is not true, it was invented in a university. The industry is just exploiting and exploiting it in a very large scale with large data sets and accumulating uh, a lot of people around these uh, data sets uh, and problems. But we are in a phase of exploitation. In the last five, six years, I don't think anyone has done a dramatic new innovation after deep learning came, and I'm sure others might have opinions uh, on this. So I don't think it's a trade secret uh, question. Most of the things, uh, if you read patents, most of the things are anyway written in most of uh, the patents. Uh, I mean, at least in my experience, I've not seen that to be a problem. Yeah. Okay, we'll take, maybe we're running out of time, so maybe you yeah. should catch him offline. Yeah, yeah but okay, we'll just take one more. Yeah. Quick question, yeah. My it's point blank question because professor asked that the industry has not been supporting much of academia. So point blank question to aspiring minds. Is uh. aspiring minds supporting academia somehow? Because we know about Microsoft's philanthropic efforts. And that is really appreciated. No, no, so uh, we would be doing more and more support through our CSR. So we thankfully are a profitable startup unlike many other startups, which also we have to be, if we don't, we have to spend CSR money for compliance. So we are looking at a lot of those efforts, but I would again say the same thing. Please don't ask industry to support academia. You have to build a case to the industry that, you know, why an IBM goes to an MIT is because they think that they will benefit out of it in the long term. That's why they fund research at MIT. They don't fund research at MIT to do charity. And I think till that notion doesn't change that we are in a market and you have to tell, make, make this understanding get into people that when you are supporting research, you are supporting your own business in the long term. That linkage has to be made. So if you will ask me this question, I will give you a blah, blah, blah answer just to look good and say that, you know, we're gonna do this, this, this for the academy, but that's not, that's not the way the market, I believe in market forces and changing market forces. I don't think that's the way market can change. You know, having said that, we are doing ML India and we are doing data science kids and so on, all those efforts which are completely thankless, right, and writing a book. <laughs> which never makes money for, in 90% cases, for anyone. At least in MSR's case, I think we see tremendous value, you know, in just interacting with academia, I mean, apart from events like these. So I think the point that he makes is, is completely lived by us, and I think it's hopefully that a model that uh, more people will follow on. With that, I think, thank you. Thank you. It's been a great uh, pleasure you. having you. And uh, really, thank you for coming here. Thank yeah. you. Thanks.